So uh, hello again, everybody. My name is Angelos Diamantopoulos and I am a lecturer in the Department of Economics. I do mostly my research is in microeconomics, but I teach microeconomics and uh, quantitative subjects for the department. And I'm also the admissions tutor and the program convener for the undergraduates, uh, for the undergraduate programs, which basically means that I am uh, someone who looks over the undergraduate programs to make sure that they are uh, run well and I deal with any issues that have to do with the running of the undergraduate programs. So this will be a very short video. So I, 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 the presentation I hope will be around 20, 25 minutes uh, in which I will discuss a few things about the department and our programs and a little bit about also the career prospects of having a degree in economics at SOAS. In addition, we have with us uh, June, June Ters, who is a student of uh, BA uh, Economics and Politics, who will also uh, share a few of her thoughts about her experience of studying at SOAS uh, as an undergraduate student. And we also have Sakina, who is another student of economics, who will also be available for questions if you have any questions for her. Both of, uh, both of these are students, current students in the department, and they are uh, here to tell you about their experience in studying with us. So the outline of the talk is the following. I'm going to just briefly discuss our department. What is it that makes SOAS economics different uh, from other economic department, departments maybe, or what are the special characteristics of the department uh, of economics? discuss a little bit in the, our programs, so the different types of programs that we have, uh, their structure, their qualifications, and their requirements, and things like this. And then again, as I said, a little bit about our career prospects and employability. I will have a long time at the end. I will leave a, lot, a long time in the end for Q&A. So feel free to ask questions while I'm, I'm doing the presentation by talking or by writing in the chat but also keep in mind that there will be some time left over in the end for, for Q&A. So in describing SOAS economics, we tend to use these four adjectives, which are real world, rigorous, regional, and research led, which we feel is a good way to describe what are the uh, particular features of our department. So just to explain a little bit what each of those terms mean. So by real world, we mean that differently maybe from a lot of other economic degrees at different universities, we tend to focus on the real world as well as uh, abstract theories and economic theories, which sometimes tend to be uh, from a distance from what's actually happening in the real world. So we do this with many ways. Uh, we use examples in our teaching that are current examples. Um, we have experts who uh, teach who share parts of the research, which is active ongoing research about things that are happening today. And we also try to uh, give examples that span the whole world in, in our, in our uh, lectures and not just say the UK or Europe or the global West. Just an example of this real world uh, attitude or this real world approach. Just now, as we're sp speaking, there is this COP26 and the climate crisis, which is uh, an event that takes place today and tomorrow about uh, COP26, which is happening in the UK now and is discussing the issues of the climate crisis and the issues in the world the world is facing due to the climate crisis. And we have uh, a few members of the department currently giving speeches at this event discussing uh, what are the potential problems, what are the issues with the climate that the world is facing, and what are the possible economic solutions that uh, can be and should be taken by governments, international organizations, peoples, and so on. So this is one example of what I mean by real world taking place right now. By rigorous, uh, what we mean is that, as you probably know, economics is a fairly quantitative subject. So you will do a lot of qualitative research. You will do a lot of topics that do not have any math requirements. But a lot of economics is mathematical and is quantitative. And in an undergraduate degree at SOS, you will have that side of the uh, that side of the experience as well. There will be, uh, firstly, in your core modules, in your theory modules, there will be uh, quantitative parts. 
but also there is a lot of support given in mathematical modules, which are specifically designed to support uh, students learning economics. A lot of those modules for undergraduates I teach. So this is what I mean by what we mean by rigorous. Regional, of course, being at SOAS, we have a lot of experts that have a regional expertise. So their expertise might be uh, in many different parts of the world, but also focused in Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia, Latin America. And so what that does is that both in the general courses, in the general lectures, in everyday teaching, there are, as I said, regional examples that are brought into the picture, but also you have optional courses that you can take, especially at the last, latter types of the stages of your studies. So this is around year three, where you can have options. We have a specific regional focus. So if you're interested about Japan or the Chinese economy uh, or the Middle Eastern economy, you can take regional options which have that as basis. But also, of course, we have a very strong language department and that language department has uh, language that you can take as part of your degree and that can also give you another way to specialize even deeper culturally within regions that you're interested in and the final thing is research led so what we mean by this is differently from again some universities we do not have many colleagues who are just teaching focused and what they do is teaching so you might know that a lot of universities have uh, are either teaching universities, so they're focused on teaching, or they have a lot of teaching staff, which, which their expertise is on teaching. We at SOAS in general, but in the economics department specifically, are a research-led institution, which means most of the academics of the department do research as well as teaching. And of course, this is good for you in the sense that a lot of this research, which is at the forefront of their field, is brought into the teaching is brought into the modules. Modules are changed based on what is going on and the research side of things. But it's also a way to, uh, for example, there's also weekly uh, research seminars that you, are, uh, you can attend that are uh, by highly prof high profile speakers and academics. And uh, this gives a network, an academic network that is different from uh, being at the university, which is just teaching focus. Sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble changing the slide. So this is a very literal uh, description of what our department currently looks like. So this is our, these are all the, our colleagues in the department currently. Uh, we have many different colleagues from across the world. And we also have as a department a, a 50% uh, gender balance, which is quite rare in economics. So there's almost as many women as men. I think it's almost exactly 50%, which, as I said, is quite uh, rare. And uh, the colleagues in the department, as I said, most are, the vast majority is very research active and they work on very different things, such as economic growth, environment, and climate, which are some of them are discussing, as I said, now in COP26. Uh, there, there's a colleague leading on a very big project across different universities and institutions on corruption. Uh, we have a professor who is famous for his work on financialization. Uh, we have um, colleagues that work on development economics, gender economics, on the Japanese economy, the Chinese economy, and many other areas of interest. And this is the list of the programs that we offer. So there are effectively five distinct programs that we offer. These are the BSc Economics, BA Economics, BSc Development Economics, BA uh, Economics as a joint degree. So that is economics and some, something else from a different uh, discipline, from a different department, for example, economics and politics, or economics and law, or economics and the language and so on. And also there is a new degree, which is starting this year, which is called the uh, Politics, Philosophy and Economics, PPE, which is the most multidisciplinary degree you can have, which is partly run by economics, by the philosophy department and by the politics department. Uh, just to briefly tell you about the BSc Economics degree. So for the BSc Economics degree, it is the more quantitative uh, degree that we 
have, and for that you, you need A-level mathematics with a grade of B or above to enter. And this is, uh, as I say, the most uh, rigorous mathematical degree that we have. However, you can also do BA economics, which BA economics doesn't have this uh, requirement for mathematics. And BA economics is a program that can be structured in many different ways. So one reason you might want to do BA economics is because you don't want to have the quantitative side. You want to be able to choose more options. You have the, the availability to choose more options from different departments as well. Uh, and so you might want to have this degree because of the flexibility it offers, but also because of the lack of the quantitative uh, subjects. But if you wish to graduate with a BSc economics, then you can start on the BA economics and automatically graduate with a BSc economics if you take a specific pathway, what we call the BSc pathway. So what this is effectively, it's just a set of modules which are created so that students can catch up with the knowledge of uh, A-level mathematics that they don't have or equivalent, and then slowly come up to the uh, level of mathematics that the BSc economics students have, and then be able to follow all the quantitative subjects from BSc economics and just automatically graduate with a BSc economics degree. So, if you're interested in, in doing a BSc economics, you can do it without A-level mathematics, starting from uh, this BA economics uh, BSc pathway. We also have the BSc development economics, which has a special focus on development, which is something that we have a lot of expertise on, as you may imagine. Uh, and we have a lot of experts, expert colleagues who work on development. And this also can be structured in a more or less technical way. And also there is support for students that do not have A-level mathematics to be able to take more quantitative subjects. And then uh, the joint degrees is something quite rare for economics departments and for the universities in the UK in general. You have the opportunity to split this degree between economics and a language, a language or another discipline. And you can also have economics as a first or second subject, which means whichever is your second subject, you will have less modules on or less focus on uh, in general. Uh, what I also wanted to highlight in this slide is that for all students, there is the opportunity to, to take a summer school in a university in Singapore between your second and third year, for which your the fees and the travel is, is covered. Students have to pay for accommodation. And this is a credit bearing summer school. So what that means is that basically the modules that you take in that summer school, you don't have to take during your last year uh, back at SOAS. So you can have a little bit of a less uh, difficult or less full program in your final year, but also, of course, the opportunity to study at a different university at a different uh, place uh, far away from the UK. So this is something that uh, is also an opportunity that students might be very interested in. In. So just to talk to you briefly about our teaching, uh, we try our teaching to be interactive and participatory, by which I mean that basically we try to engage our students in our teaching as, as much as possible. We don't have only the very standard lectures of our person like me now sitting and, and talking to people that are just listening, but we also have uh, we structure the lectures in a way that students are engaged, students are asked to participate and talk and things like this. But more specifically, the teaching takes place broadly as a mix of lectures, uh, tutorials, and pre-recording material. The pre-recording material is something that are pre-recorded in pre-recorded lectures. It's something that we have introduced from the since the pandemic, but it's something that students like a lot where some parts of the lecture, some parts of the key lessons of each week are pre-recorded so you can see before the, the lecture. The lecture is a standard lecture in which you have a lecture teaching to university to students, but again, in a way that's as participatory as possible. And then tutorials, which are uh, much more hands-on. Students are asked to engage in conversations, uh, prepare some readings, discuss those readings, or for quantitative subjects, 
you know solve exercises and and show the solutions or discuss the solutions and in general we try our teaching of quantitative subject to be very hands-on so instead of just teaching and having exams at the end of the year that students are meant to take we follow the students through the year there is support outside the lectures that students can have to discuss uh, specific issues with the lecture directly and have kind of learning that is very much catered for the specific issues that the student may have with the quantitative subject. <clears throat> and in general, uh, we assess students in many different ways. So the more standard way of assessing uh, students is with exams and almost all modules have exams which take place in the May June period. But those exams are, the weight of those exams, the significance of those exams is generally, as years goes on, decreasing. So modules will have between 50 and 80% uh, grades depending on the exam, and the rest depends on assessment, uh, which happens throughout the year, and we use different types of assessment to help students build skills that are of uh, different, um, uh, different types of skills, I'm sorry. So, for example, we do group work. Uh, an example of group work for first year students would be what we call festival of learning, which is that we split all students into groups and these groups uh, make a presentation on an economic issue, an economic topic or an economic question in a way that is participatory and creative. And then they present those uh, videos in the period of the pandemic or actual physical presentations at the end of the year to the rest of their class and so and they are uh, assessed based on that presentation as a group but we also have uh, in different modules policy briefs blogs posts uh, country reports of course essays uh, and multiple choice sort of quizzes so there is many different ways that students get assessed and those different types of assessments are there to build different kinds of skills skills that our alumni generally tell us are very very uh, useful in the in their workplace so working in a team meeting deadlines uh, working with data and software uh, being able to analyze data create policy reports or other types of reports are all things that students tend to do our students tend to do in the workplace after studying at SOAS and these are things that they have honed uh, in due because of the assessment structure of their modules uh, in general during their studies uh, fundamental, of course, to all of this is to teach students and, and for students to learn and to be proficient in economic theory. That's the most important task, as well as its application of, from a global perspective. So I discussed a little bit, I gave you a kind of an overview of what uh, teaching is like and how we do teaching on a kind of per module basis. But of course, there is a lot of support that comes out of the, that is beyond and outside the module. So uh, that support can be very much focused on studying. And we do have uh, from the library uh, learning, teaching and innovation center. There's a lot of study skill workshops that take place throughout the year. Some are online, some are on campus on different things. So how to write essays, how to um, cite, cite, make citations properly, how to study. Um, there is also we're going to be running this year uh, a workshop on how to make uh, how to do public speaking which can also be very useful for students uh, and many more so this support exists and students can have access to it uh, throughout the year but as well we have what we call uh, an academic advisor assigned to each student so an academic advisor is basically uh, a student uh, uh, sorry an, an academic member of staff like me, for example, that is assigned, that a student is assigned to. So all students are assigned to an academic advisor in the beginning of their studies. And this is someone who stays there throughout their studies. And it's someone that they can talk to about academic issues, uh, questions that they may be having, difficulties that may be having studying or their experience of studying in general, discuss module choices, discuss uh, maybe job placement, internships, career concerns, and stuff like that. So this is a person who is there to 
the uh, point of contact and have a kind of a, an overview oversight of the student's journey throughout the three years. In addition, we have what we call peer mentoring for first year students. So this is a student led initiative. Uh, one of the students running this is actually June, who is uh, going to speak to us in a few minutes. And this peer mentoring is basically that all first year students are assigned to an older student, a mentor who is willing to, to take that role, take that initiative. And that mentor again is there to uh, help students with uh, different types of questions from academic related questions, how to do things in the library, how to print papers, which courses to choose or how to study for a course to uh, more broad life issues like where to live in London or where to go out for lunch and so on. We have a dedicated career service, which has career first, career events, a very uh, large job database that is shared with students uh, frequently, but also there's a workshop that students have to go that is run by the career services that it tells them uh, key information that they need to know about applying for jobs, internships, and so on. We also have a very active global alumni network uh, and in particular, we're running this thing called the e-mentoring via SOAS Connect, which is a platform through which uh, students can get in contact with alumni, so people who had studied, have studied at SOAS before, both graduate and undergraduate. Uh, and this is because we have a very global network of students, especially our postgraduate students are from all over the world, and often they tend to go back to uh, the world. Uh, to where they came from, or some of them do, or in any case, go in place outside the UK. This network is quite global and that can connect students, especially that are interested to go to other places. You can find the alumni that is in these countries. And this is something that many students have found very, very uh, nice and useful. And of course, there are many societies, student societies. Some of them are economics related. So I, I have here the Source Open Economic Forum. Uh, Economics and Finance Society, the Islamic Finance and Ethics Society, uh, but there are many other societies that students can take, can be a part of both economic related societies or uh, of uh, something else. Uh, and these are, of course, societies that are run by students. So I think I don't know if June wants to uh, come in and uh, share her experience at SOAS for just a bit, and then I'll, I'll take over. Of course. Um, can everyone hear me or? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so my name is June and I'm a final year student pursuing a dual degree in economics and politics. Something which has definitely added to my SOAS experience is being a mentor for the freshers of the economics department. It's a good way to give back. And in my own first year, I also had a mentor and um, he helped me loads with academic questions and fun things to do in London or so as, especially as someone who's not from England. Um, and it's also good to keep being involved in the student community. Another great thing about my degree is that I'm doing a joint degree of economics and politics. It works really well together. I learn a lot about decolonization and climate change and policy. Um, and what's great about it as well is that I can specialize um, in both politics and economic modules to different regions. Um, so later this year, I will be doing economic development in China and East Asia. Aside from this, my academic advisor is also great. She's, she's helped me so much when I've had questions about exams or essays. And more recently, as I'm going towards my final year in graduating, we've been discussing my options for the future. She's heavily invested in my personal growth and wants to help me succeed. Um, the career services is also really great for any questions. And in my second year, I regularly look um, for internship opportunities. I'm also involved in several societies such as women's football, crypto society. And last year during um, the pandemic when everything was closed, but we were allowed to go outside and do exercise, um, I was, I created a cycling group. This was a great way to meet people from SOAS and further discover London. Um, <clears throat> during my final year of SOAS, I'm really looking forward to the module economics of the environment. It's an important module in today's age and time. It covers macro and micro perspective of the issue and tackles climate change. 
and it also discusses intergenerational equity and how we can assure the well-being of those alive today and future generations. Thank you very much, June. That was great. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, so let me just continue briefly. I want to start kind of wrapping up this talk because already I think it's gone longer than what I was hoping for. But just to give you a, a brief uh, description of what employability looks like if you have a degree at SOAS. So this is uh, the SOAS Economics Graduate Destinations. It's an average of the last three years. I think it doesn't include the last year, so it's the previous three years probably. And uh, you can also see that, I mean, already this looks like a very good, uh, the uh, employability process are pretty good. And most of our students, the vast, vast majority of students gets uh, uh, a job after their studies. The difficulty also here is that this misses out on the students who leave the UK and especially for postgraduate, because this is coming from the HMRC, if I'm not mistaken, but in any case, it's government UK data. So this is data for those who stay uh, into the UK, those who don't stay into the UK, th their status is lost. So this is also where this 6% of other comes from. And because especially for our, so our, our undergraduate student bodies, mostly from the UK, but our postgraduate student body is very international. And a lot of those students then go to uh, go abroad to work. And those are kind of lost within the system. So that's part of the 6% there. And uh, you can see here, I have the list of skills that students are expected or students will gain from studying at SOAS. I don't really want to really uh, I read through that list, but I think from my discussion, what I was talking about teaching before, you get a sense of uh, the, the, the skills that one can hope to build from studying an economics degree in general and an economics degree specifically here at SOAS. But to give you a little bit of a face to this career story, I'll just tell you these three placements. They're all very recent. So Bijan, he did an economics and politics degree like June and he's currently a senior policy advisor for the Department of International Trade in the UK. Uh, Nadine is a BSc economics student, recent economics student as well, and her story is quite interesting because she's now an economic consultant at BJW International Development Consultancy, which is a consultancy uh, on development based in the UK and the EU. But what is interesting about her story, one, Thing that is interested is that she found a job she was contacted by a SOAS alumni and uh, uh, she met with that SOAS alumni and that SOAS alumni was uh, running this consultancy and, and she uh, found a job there. And finally, Tatiana, who finished her degree last year in 2021, and she's currently a global data, environmental, social and governments fixed income and uh, lead analyst at Bloomberg. Uh, these are three examples, three phases of students uh, that have studied recently at SOAS an undergraduate degree. And finally, I'm going to leave you with this screen, which is this uh, um, slide, which is basically the most common graduate destinations of, destinations of students at SOAS. These are places where uh, both our students are very keen to go to typically and where many students do end up going to. So. This is just to give you a sense of uh, the kind of graduate destinations that you can expect or students that study at SOAS uh, end up with, end up to. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for listening. And there are, I'm going to really leave the rest of the time for questions. So uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Again, uh, this is, you can ask me questions on, uh, anything that you might want via the chat or uh, using the microphone, turning on your video if you want to. I don't know if anyone has any questions. I don't see the raise your hand function. So if you do raise your hands, don't worry about it, just uh, speak. Well, we just take a second to let any of your questions come through. Um, would you maybe like to speak a little bit about sort of um, dissertation and um, sort of final year project kind of elements? Yeah, that could be interesting. 
Yes, thank you, Dan. So yeah, let me say a couple more things of uh, that I haven't uh, that I haven't maybe said. So one thing that I wanted to so if you wanted, I can go into a little bit more detail about our program structure. Uh, so the way that programs in general are organized is that you have some core subject and compulsory subjects and some optional subjects. So the core and compulsory subjects are those that you have to take uh, depending on your degree. And then the optional subjects are things you can choose, different courses you can choose. Uh, these optional subjects can be sometimes from the economics department, what we call guided options, and sometimes from other departments, whichever department across the school, a language or a non-language option. And the way most degrees are structured is that your first year is usually more core subjects, so you don't you have less choice, so you, you are told this course that you need to take. But as you progress in your second and then as you progress to your third year, you have more choices. So then you have a lot more choices to do with, uh, yeah, as I said, choices from within the economics department, specific regional focus, specific area of economics that you might be interested in, uh, finance, banking, international trade, environmental economics that June mentioned, uh, the gender economics, many other subjects that you can choose, and also the regional subjects. Uh, and also, uh, so you have more options like that. So I get a question here from Charissa, thank you very much, which is where would students study in Singapore? So this partnership that I mentioned, the summer school, is with the Singapore University of Management, if I'm not mistaken, but I might be mistaken. Uh, there is information of this on our website, but I think it's the Singapore University of Management. But I might be mistaken with the name. Uh, yeah, so there is, so yeah, there are more options as you go along. And there's also at the final year, like Dan mentioned, there is a, a, a study project, ISP individual study project that students can take, which is a dissertation that you can focus on something that you're interested in with a supervisor that is uh, supervising the dissertation throughout the year. Uh, and that can be a, a qualitative essay or a quantitative essay, an econometric essay where you do some uh, data analysis and things like this, which are also, uh, if you want, a lot of our courses are uh, data driven and econometrics uh, driven, especially in the second and third year. Do I do we consider applications with retakes? Um, what is a retake? Chris, is that maybe um, A level exam retakes or, or equivalent? Yes, 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 we do. So so you can see if you look at the website what are the different qualifications and different requirements to get into the studies but uh, if you if you feel that you like the degree if you feel that you like uh, studying at SOAS if there is something that you know in today's discussion or in general click for you for whatever reason do not hesitate to apply it is very possible that on certain occasions if you have you know a very good personal statement or some very good aspects of your application and some qualifications are not exactly met you could still be made an offer so uh, yes yes i think that's not a problem at all i i don't think that we would even look negatively at that at all to be honest there is there what would we look at is the final uh, degrees the final what you got in your ib total after the retakes uh yeah no problem so do we accept application with a deferred entry uh again i'm not so if you if you mean applications that you you want instead of wanting to start in the next academic year if you want to start in the year after that to be honest as an as an admissions tutor i don't remember seeing applications like this but yes we can do that and what is what I know for sure does happen is that students who are accepted for this year then de defer their entry to the next year, and this is something that we are, we do uh, allow. So I'm not exactly sure on the technical side of how you would do this, but I do know of cases of students who were supposed to start this year and have deferred their studies for next year. Uh, these are also questions that you can take up with admissions if you're interested uh, at admissions. I think it's undergraduate admissions at source.ac.uk, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you can also use the um, study at soas.ac.uk email address that I put in the chat earlier on. 
Um, but as well, just to quickly add to deferred admissions, when you make your UCAS application, when you apply through UCAS, from memory, there's a box that you can tick, which says uh, defer application. And then that just lets us know that you'd be intending to start in the following year. But um, as has been mentioned there, if you if you make your normal application and then decide you might want to defer your entry, um, you just drop an email to admissions or, or to any of our email addresses and we um, will speak to you about getting that processed. Thank you very much, Dan, yes. Uh, Sakina also put the email there, which thank you, Sakina, which is uh, uh, the email for admissions. Also, Sakina is a student, as, uh, as we said, from the a third year student from the economics department. If you want to ask a question, ask her a question, feel free to do so as well. Uh, Charissa, this is the same question. I think that was just answered by Dan. And this is the question that uh, Eduardo, Eduardo, I think, also made, which is uh, about deferred entry. So deferred application is exactly the same as applying for 2023, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Anything else about the program, about the economics, maybe? No, so thank you, John, for your question. So John asks whether the candidates will be invited for interview. No, we don't have an interview process. So I think you apply through UCAS and uh, your application is either accepted or not accepted. Usually your, your offer will be a conditional offer. So if you're still uh, doing A-levels or whatever other qualifications you're doing, your offer will be based on you achieving certain grades, uh, but without an interview. Uh, Eduardo, yes, yeah, so that, uh, so I can, for example, if you guys are interested, this is, uh, this is the structure of the uh, degrees. So this is the BSc and BA economics, uh, but also the, if you want, I can show you the BSc development economics and the joint programs. So for the BSc, for example, if you, you can see here for the BSc economics, the first year, we, you would have uh, economic principles. This is micro and macro. Uh, elementary statistics and statistics. Applied economic issues in the global economy, which is a development-based uh, one-term module. And then uh, you would have mathematics for economics, which is our first uh, quantitative module. And you additionally do this. So these are the courses that you have to take in your first year. As I said, the first year has more subjects that you have to take, and then there's more options. And then uh, you have 30 credits of optional modules, which is a 15 credit is a one-term module. So 30 credits is two one-term modules. And this can be a language, or this can be something from another department, from politics, from law, from what, wherever. Uh, so that would be what the BSc looks like. If you see the BA economics, it has 45 open uh, modules, uh, which is again, as I said, the BA has a little bit more options unless you do the BSc pathway where you have these extra quantitative subjects which bring you up to speed to A-levels. So that's what the first year of the BSc looks like. If you look at the development economics and the joint programs, the first year looks like this. So the BSc development will have, uh, it's very similar the first year actually to the BSc economics. And the BA developments will have only micro macro economics and the rest you can take from, a, from your other subject that's for the first year and then you see the year two and then year three as you can see there's a lot more options and maybe this is something also that is interesting to students the kind of options that exist so this is not uh, a full list these are mainly options for uh, from the economics department again there are options outside the economics department and there are such as econometrics global financial markets international economics development economics banking and finance gender economics environmental economics applied econometrics and different regional modules with a focus on Africa, China, Middle East, Japan. Uh, that's it. So the the A-level grades, typical BSc economics offer would be the qualification. So ABB typically. No, AAB, I'm sorry, AAB. There is also a distinction between if you, are, if you belong to a widening participation group, so that means people from uh, that either that do, do not have family that has gone to higher uh, education or from impoverished neighborhoods or uh, in 
different, you can see the qualifications for people that belong to the widening participation category. The offer for economics is ABB. For uh, everybody else, it's AAB. Uh, you're welcome. Ah, this is a very good point, uh, Charissa. Thank you very much for asking this, which I forgot to mention, which is that for exactly what uh, Charissa asks, which is exactly for those that do a joint degree with a language, for example, economics and Japanese, the language program has a year abroad uh, into the degree. So that year abroad, you go to Japan, you go to whichever country it is the language you're doing, and you uh, have a placement that you work there and or so that you learn the language. Uh, or I'm not entirely sure if you work there, but you go to the country and you, of course, use the language. That's the whole point. And yes, this will be exactly if you have a joint degree in economics and the language, then that can include, if you want to, uh, a year abroad, which is between the third, between the second and third year. So you do four years, the first two at SOAS, then a year abroad, then back at SOAS for your final year. And this is something also that students uh, do, do and enjoy very much. Uh, you're welcome. Um, any other questions? Maybe just before we, oh, sorry, there's a question there for you, Andres. Is there an option for students to have placement opportunity before? Well, this is a good question. It is something that uh, a lot of students are keen on. The way that it happens so far is usually with a summer internship, but we are working towards having something like that. So there is, a, a, so we are working towards having uh, the opportunity for a placement period uh, in your third year of studies, but it's not something that is yet uh, exists in our program. So you, I shouldn't say it uh, uh, with a very high degree of certainty, but it's something that we're working on to have degrees that do include uh, some placement opportunity. As it currently stands, placement opportunities happen in as uh, internships during the summer. Although, and again, not so much of an, as a an very official way, but it, th there are students who take a year off at some point in their studies if there is a good reason for it. And sometimes that could be uh, an unofficial placement so that they work for a year and then they come back. Yes, exactly. That is what Sakina says. So you, you could interrupt your degree to do a placement. Again, this is not an entirely official thing. So it's not something that necessarily the university fully supports but if you want to do it and if you're very if you keenly want to do it that would be possible so i think dan you were about to say something i think we should uh, more uh, we could we could uh, wrap up i don't know if you think there's something that i should uh, add I think I think it's been a it's been a great session. Um, hopefully, everyone's questions have been answered. Um, just in the last minute or two, there was something Sakina shared with me earlier about um, something called Cakeonomics. I was just wondering if she might like to um, sort of share with share with the guests. It sounded quite interesting, a nice opportunity. Yeah. So in our first year, obviously, second year was a little bit affected by COVID, but they're hoping to get it back this year. We had at the end of term this event called Cakeonomics, which is essentially an it's a free event where students and staff from the economics department all gather together in just one of the buildings and you're fed cakes, little sweet treats, tea, coffee, and some, I think there was Prosecco, but I'm not sure. Um, and it's just a really nice way to get to know people outside of the classroom because you're not just meeting your friends, all of your academic advisors, the tutors are all there. Mm. Uh, we're running this again this year. Uh, thank you very much, Sakina, for this. Yes, we're running. So we do a lot of events that are outside the curriculum, let's say, which are some social events. So this year we'll be running Cakeonomics. We'll be running um, some quizzes for second and third year students. So you, Sakina, also can be a part of those, uh, but also for first years, which are 
quizzes about how well do you know the economics department, which would be, uh, yeah, again, social events with questions and game quiz-esque uh, games so that students can, uh, I mean, like Sakina said, meet each other and, and new people, but also their tutors and their lecturers uh, and also tutors and lectures of other classes that they don't do. So we do try to, uh, and this year, like Sakina said very rightly last year, was a difficult year COVID-wise that happened less socializing was more virtual, which works to a level, but uh, this year it will be much more on campus. Next year for you guys, hopefully a lot more on campus also. Uh, and that's, yeah, we do try to have events for students to meet staff and to socialize with staff and staff are generally on the whole, fairly friendly. Uh, so uh, Sakina and June and Dan, thank you very much for uh, your help. Uh, everybody who came, thanks very much for your questions. I hope it was informative. And uh, I think uh, this is a good time to wrap it up. Yeah, I'm just going to put uh, two things in the chat that people might be interested in. Um, the first is a link to um, chat with the students. Um, so we have Sakina on there um, as an economic student. So if you do want to get that, any more sort of questions about student experience, you can jump on there and it's a sort of text based chat that you can use. Otherwise, if you have any questions that are more sort of, uh, say, official for the university as such, admissions, deferred entry, et cetera, et cetera, you can contact us there at study at soas.ac.uk. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you very much. Have a good day.